Before we get started, I have a quick favor. I've been self-funding the Finding Genius podcast for five years now. I've done over 3,000 episodes. And as you can see on YouTube, we're up over a million views on the channel, which is fantastic. The next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD and working on a product to help people overcome these problems because I've seen them explode recently after the, the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously give us a thumbs up and check in the description for buy me a coffee it's about five bucks if you could buy me a coffee i'd really appreciate it. it would help keep the channel going and i love coffee thank you forget frequently asked questions common sense common knowledge or google how about advice from a real genius 95 percent of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed five percent go above and beyond they become very good at what they do but only 0.1 percent a real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. I have uh, Dr. Emron Mayer. He's the author of a new book called The Gut Immune Connection, How Understanding Why We're Sick Can Help Us Regain Our Health. Um, I spoke to Emron a couple of years ago. Uh, he's very knowledgeable about the microbiome, and I'm glad to have him back. So, uh, Emron, thank you for coming back. I really appreciate it. Yeah, Rich, uh, thanks for having me on the show. It's a pleasure. Yeah. Well, tell me, how did you get involved in, uh, in medicine and research? And you know, what were you doing before this? Uh, what, what got you interested, especially in the microbiome? What got me interested in medicine? I, I have to be honest. You know, I'm I'm not somebody who knew from uh, from first grade on that, uh, or, or my parents didn't think that that I would go into medicine. I struggled uh, throughout, you know, end of high school, college, to really make a decision what professional path I wanted to take, and um, that included everything from what was hot at the time: sociology, political sciences, psychology. And medicine, but medicine was definitely not one of the top, you know, top choices. And then really out of, I mean, science has always interested me as a, as a, as a kid, not, not necessarily biological sciences, but then, you know, based on my uh, grades, the GPA I had, everybody was saying, Oh, you have to, you know, you have to go to medical school. And really in the last minute, I decided to do that, you know, that, um, last minute to that, that that I could apply. And um, somehow I, I think um, these different interests have sort of stayed in my mind, in the background of my mind. I, I'm not somebody who has exclusively an interest in, in, in hard science and, and in medicine, even though I've greatly enjoyed my career, both helping patients and, uh, you know, being at the cutting edge of research in the uh, brain gut field for pretty much all my professional career and um the the decision to pick brain gut uh, interactions initially was just brain gut and later became brain gut microbiome it was there from the beginning i think because it sort of allowed me to incorporate my psychological interests you know with 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 medicine and um yeah i've i've, I've done this for some almost like i would say 40 years going through very different stages of research from studying uh, isolated cells in the test tube, recording from isolated nerve cells to doing studies in mouse models uh, to then switching almost completely to human studies. And um, about seven years ago, when first microbiome science, the first spectacular findings were published that the microbes could actually influence behavior in the brain, I was initially skeptic and then incorporate that later in in our research center, in my own research program. And, you know, that has become sort of a, a major focus. So now the, the brain-gut microbiome axis is sort of the, the topic that I'm most interested in. Right. Okay. Well, tell me about your new book. What, uh, what new information did you put in there? Why did you write this latest one? Yeah, so this was something, I mean, certainly being involved, being uh, immersed in 
in the science of this and also now, you know, being faced with a tremendous, I mean, after my first book, you know, most of my patients came to my office with the book in hand and wanted want to have it signed and want to have it explained or saying that some of the the patient stories I had in that book, that was them, you know, it, it, it was so similar to what they had experienced. So um, it, it was, a new, so I thought it's a good time five years later to write another book, to update a lot of things that have happened in, 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 in the research field. When the first one was written, you know, there were, there were a few animal studies that we based most of our, this concept on. And my, my agent at the time reading the first draft said, this is ridiculous. Nobody's interested in, in mouse studies. The, the people that you want to target are interested in human studies. And that was hard at the time, quite honestly. So now I think we have a lot more studies. So in, I felt for the first time I could really write an authoritative book. Uh, discussing the latest studies in humans and what this means for for human diseases, brain diseases, and others as well. And um, so that was one. The other one was while writing the book. This was definitely a a personal growth um, uh, process. That you know the pandemic happened. There was a lot of discussion about this this epidemic of, of chronic non infectious diseases. Uh, that is going on with metabolic diseases and uh, so not just in, in in the brain but really affecting uh, every si- or uh, organ system in the body that are now being linked in some ways to the the interactions of the microbes with the immune system and that sort of became really uh, the main focus of 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 this book you know so uh, bef- the first time it was all microbiome brain this time it's microbiome, it's diet, microbiome, immune system, uh, and other organ systems. Okay. So what, what um, when people talk about the gut brain axis, what does that look like? What's it mediated by? Like, how does the, the communication happen between the gut and the brain? Let's start with that. So the gut brain axis is, um, is a bidirectional. It's actually, you know, I've, I, I use now the term brain gut microbiome system because it is not just an axis it's not a linear communication um system but but it's it's really a uh, you know what we call like in systems biology something um nodes that are interconnected by bidirectional loops and feedback loops so it's much more complicated than an axis what is what it is is we have known for quite some time that the brain can send uh, signals to the gut and change pretty much the entire repertoire of gut functions. You know, the, the gut has its own nervous system, the enteric nervous system or little brain of the gut, which takes care of um, pretty much an autonomous way of all gut functions and adaptations to diet uh, and what we put in it. But it's it's dependent on influence from the brain to inform it about uh, emotional states of the brain, about perturbations that happen in in the rest of the body outside the gut and also stressors that occur um, from the environment so the gut can run on its own and there have been experiments you know with mouse intestine or guinea pig intestine that a piece of in, uh, isolated intestine in a test tube can pretty much do the same peristaltic contractions as an intact gut but it cannot respond to all these other influences that I just mentioned. So the brain in response to, you know, I, I prefer the term perturbations of homeostasis to stress. Uh, so anything that threatens, either threatens or actually does perturb the, the homeostatic action of, of, of the body. Before we continue. I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, 
transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click support us today. Now back to the show. It generates nerve signals through the autonomic nervous system, particularly the sympathetic nervous system to the gut, which changes everything from contractions to transit to secretions to permeability to blood flow. So, uh, you know, any any gut function yeah. can be taken up. So this gives the gut a pretty unique position that um, our all our emotional states that we can, if, if we, a good observer can see in facial expressions of a person are also happening at the gut level. You know, we can't see it there, but we, we do know that that is happening. What are, the, what are some examples here? Like if I eat something I know is not going to make me feel good. I eat, I don't know, like a White Castle belly bombers. And I'm like, oh, my stomach's hurting me. Um, what's going on there? Is it, is it interacting with my brain? And why would my stomach hurt if I eat something that doesn't agree with me? And why would I feel like, well, oh. So there might be two components. So if you already know beforehand, this doesn't agree with you. Um, even before you eat it, the, the brain would send signals down to the gut to put it on alert. So you, it's not the same, you know, it's not the same condition or I would say, you know, the table is set in a different way than for a celebration, the table in the gut, so to speak. And once the food gets down there, it's likely that your gut will react in a fashion that's not ideal for absorption and transport. If there's something in that food, let's say there's, you know, there's a, there's a virus or there's a toxin or something that makes you feel bloated, obviously that's being encoded then in the gut itself. And the gut's nervous system will react to this either in form of trying to get rid of it through diarrhea or through vomiting. Um, but also it will generate signals. And that's the other part of the brain-gut interaction. It will generate signals that go from the gut to the brain. So the, the, the brain monitors what goes on in your gut all the time. There's more, there's more traffic in your brain-gut system or access from the gut to the brain than from the brain to the gut. Most of this, the brain keeps outside of conscious awareness because you would go crazy every time you eat something that you know, that you become aware of every single sensation and contraction in the gut. But if it's something that doesn't agree with you, it will send signals, the brain, you know, the warning light's gone and you will become aware of it. So cramps, gurgling, unpleasant feelings, sensations, pain, all this would be, is transmitted to the brain and becomes conscious if it's potentially, if the brain decides this is potentially bad for you. Okay. What kind of emotions come from from the gut? Is it you know, when you eat certain foods, does that uh, trigger certain emotions to to overtake you? You know, like certain things you eat, you may feel satiated and satisfied and happy. Certain ones, again, you may feel bloated and uncomfortable. Yeah. So, there, what, what kind of emotions go on, and where do you think this comes from? Yeah. So, the basic emotion with food intake is is a pleasant emotion. It's satiety, um, which you know goes along most of the time unless you overeat, uh, goes along with a, a, a pleasant feeling of contentment. And um, it's, it's, it's not a specific emotion like, you know, happiness or even though that can happen as well. If you have a meal in, a, in the context of a celebration, then this meal will uh, amplify that feeling, you know, if, if you're in a wedding or birthday party. That's, so, so in terms of the, the positive sensations, it um it 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 can also do the opposite you know it it can create anxiety if you like this podcast please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes if it's something as i mentioned before that you have been concerned beforehand before you eat it, it that that it, it's going to generate some unpleasant sensations of bloating or gas then eating this this type of food will make you anxious um so this, these food related anxieties are very common. It, you know, so in terms of other remote, like, the, uh, like a depression, that's not really established well that a particular food will make you depressed. But the opposite is true. If you are depressed and you eat, you know, comfort food, um, you, you will feel better. Not a specific emotion. You'll just reduce your, 
your negative emotion, you know, you, you feel less depressed. And that's a sort of a danger of overeating, stress-related eating, that people do feel better from, you know, eating the French fries or the, the sweets or other snacks, you know, that they're not necessarily uh, good for you. So it's a big modulator and it's not surprising because a lot of, there's a lot of cells in your gut. It's, just, it's not just a, a tube with smooth muscle that contracts and, you know, generous peristalsis. There's a lot of hormone containing cells in your gut, particularly in terms of satiety and appetite, hunger that are, you know, that are releasing these, these, these hormones are being released. For example, if your stomach is completely empty, you release a hormone called ghrelin, which m makes you feel hungry. If you, after you've eaten, particularly if it's sort of a high fat, high protein diet, it will trigger the release of other hormones further downstream in the small intestine, which will tell the brain, you know, you're full and, and makes you stop eating. So that, that's kind of the, the you know, the, the, very, the, the very basic communication. That, and, and that communication happens, these hormones are being released locally. So then they act on the vagus nerve, which carries the signal to the brain. But they're also released into your bloodstream and go in a slower fashion to your brain through the systemic circulation. So what, what happens if someone's hungry versus hangry? You know, they're really hungry and they're irritable and all that. Versus just, oh, I'm hungry. I'd like to go eat. What do you think the difference is? What's going on? I would say it's, it's, it's a more, you know, being hangry is sort of a more complex emotional feeling. You know, so, so the, the basic, the basic sensation or, or the basic feeling would really be uh, being hungry. And if depending on how you react to this, you know, you, you would add the anger to it. It's it's not a it's it's not necessarily connected to it. You know, if if you're if you embark on a on a period of fasting, uh, you're not going to get angry not, by not responding to the hunger feelings. You know, you you sort of overcome that. If you're stressed out and and hungry and you don't have access to food, you you will you know this will generate this combination will generate anger plus hunger. Then they interact with each other. I just didn't know if it was even possible to, on a, you know, on a biological level, quantify what's going on differently between being hungry or, you know, I'm like totally starving or I'm hangry or, you know, I'm satiated. You mentioned hormones, but, you know, the action of the bacteria in our guts. Has anyone thought of some kind of experimentation to quantify what's going on at the, you know, when we feel these different things? Well, metabolites are being released, et cetera. Yeah. So, if you bring so so far we've talked about the brain gut axis by itself you know when we when we bring the microbes in obviously it gets it gets more complex and less well understood i i think we pretty much know most of the things that happen between the brain and the gut it, uh, by itself but then you bring in 40 to 100 trillion microbes that all produce their own chemicals these metabolites and these these microbes are also in part of this bidirectional dialogue. So if you're stressed or angry or depressed or sad, the signals that go down to the gut and the, also affect the microbes either directly because some of these neurotransmitters and some of these hormones being released from the gut can can act on receptors of the microbes, changing the behavior of the microbes and what they then generate from the food that you eat. And on the other hand, there, there, there's so many of these of these chemicals that the microbes produce, you know, hundreds of thousands of metabolites, that some of them act on the gut itself and, and on the enteric nervous system. Some act on uh, different fiber types of the vagus nerve signaling to the brain, and some get into the bloodstream and... Um, through the blood brain barrier and affect the brain uh, directly. And then on top of all of this, you have the interactions of the microbes with the gut based immune system, you know, which is just microns away from, from the micro, from, from the microbes. And that triggers a whole nother communication channel of immune molecules that goes to the brain. So if you ask me this sort of a, a simple question, you know, do we know, when when you're not eating and and you're hungry and you get angry, what role do microbes play in this? 
Um, the only thing I can say is what we do know is if you are fasting for a long enough period of time, that this will definitely affect your your microbes in a significant way. They will move away from from the, the further away from the immune system in the gut. They you know they they produce less of of, of their these chemicals like short chain fatty acids or all the other metabolites. And so there's definitely, if, if you fast, it, it will affect the microbes in a way that they then contribute in a different way to this communication between the gut and the brain. But as a specific answer to your question, I think we're pretty far away from that. You know, I, it's, it's just too, it's, it's too complex a system. This is like, you know, I, I always use this term. It's a, it's a supercomputer that's very finely tuned. And we're just trying to understand what, um, you know, individual chips in the supercomputer do, but we don't really understand the entire system. Another question. So, well, who eats first? Does that even make sense? You know, do, do bacteria eat first when food gets to the stomach or do we eat first? Or is it a passing back and forth of like, you know, my cells take a whack at, at digesting this, you know, this food I've eaten, then they hand it off to the bacteria and they go strip other stuff off the carcass and then it gets passed back to me. And, you know, what, you know this, what do you imagine it looks like, the dynamic? Yeah, this is a, this is a great question. So, and then this, this has to do with the, where, where do the microbes live? You know, so there's, there's definitely a gradient from the stomach downstream all the way to the end of the large intestine that the density and the richness and the, um, diversity of microbes increases the further you go down there's you know we all know there's one microbe in the stomach quite well known h pylori but then you go down further down uh, first part, part of the like the duodenum and the jejunum very few uh, a very low density of microbes so but if you go down into the end of the small intestine and the colon you get the, the biggest density anywhere in the world uh, of microbes in uh, one place so that influences what's being, what happens to the food that you ingest. So the food is broken down initially mechanically and chemically in the, in the stomach, then in the first part of the small intestine. Uh, most of it is absorbed right there in the, you know, in, in the, in the duodenum, the, the, the very first part of your small intestine. So depending on what you eat, if you eat food that can all be broken down and absorbed, in the small intestine, then you feed yourself first. And that would be, for example, so with the typical standard American diet, most of it would be absorbed in, in that very beginning of the small intestine because everything is, is processed, very little fiber, you know, it's ultra, uh, ultra processed. But if you eat a diet like our ancestors used to eat, that is, you know, much, much higher in, in fiber and plant based food components there's a, there's a lot of these very large molecules called polyphenols in in plant based food that cannot be absorbed in the small intestine and that have to travel down so both the fiber and these polyphenol molecules all travel down unabsorbed until they get to the microbes and then the microbes begin to break them down into smaller pieces that are being uh, that are being absorbed so depending on your diet you are being fed first with the typical Western diet. Um, and that's one of the reasons why, you know, you know, we have our obesity problem because it's very easily absorbable, um, high caloric, high caloric density. And if you eat a largely plant-based diet, like our ancestors used to eat, then the process is, is, is very different. You know, a much smaller proportion is absorbed proximally. And most of it happens really at the, at the end of small intestine, large intestine uh, region. And it's one of the reasons why, you know, when, when people ask me, what is, what is the healthiest diet? Uh, you know, and there's, there's sort of a culture war going on, as you know, you know, between the, the vegans and the, the keto uh, defenders. And I would say it's actually quite easy. If you, if you pick a diet that feeds primarily um, your gut microbiome with these mole these large molecules is with low caloric density, then you're doing the best for yourself as well. So this means you want to have a diet that where the microbes come first and then our 
you know, nutrients and our, our well-being and, and our human of, of, of absorption early on comes second. So it, it, it's the most fundamental question really in terms of evaluating what's, what's healthy for us. And we have deviated in, in developed societies quite a bit from that principle. Is there such a thing as bacterial economics? I made this up. So I was thinking, you know, if I'm a bacteria in someone's gut and I produce a short chain fatty acid in exchange for like a certain sugar, what's the economics of that? Do I want three molecules of sugar and I'll produce one of short chain fatty acid A? Or is it one to one or five to one? And what determines that? And what do you think those ratios are? And could we discover them? So, I mean, you know, this this terms bacterial or, or microbial economics is, is actually a good a good expression because I, I mean I always say that like short chain fatty acids are kind of the the currency that microbes use to interact with with us with the host with our gut with our health and you know short chain fatty acids are basically what microbes produce from when you feed them complex carbohydrates, like, you know, fiber molecules, let's, let's just stick with, with fiber molecules or these, these polyphenols. They, so the fiber molecules are broken down by certain, by an ecosystem of collaborating microbes. So it's not every microbe does the same work in this, in this process. You know, there's some uh, that come early on that break down one chemical link and then that, that, that modified Carbohydrate molecule is then processed by the next group of microbes. So it's, it's an ecosystem or like a, you know, a factory with different components in it. And ultimately what comes out is, are, are these short chain fatty acids that have a beneficial effect for, um, you know, mainly, uh, mainly for us. I mean, the microbes themselves derive energy from, from, from these, from this metabolism, but ultimately they use this currency to, to pay us and uh, you know you could so sort of take this further in a simplistic way you know there's clearly a symbiotic relationship between our microbes and our gut the microbes produce stuff that is beneficial for us and we or our gut deliver services such as a, a stable internal environment a safe environment and a constant supply of food so i think the economy you could say is the microbes pay for for these services with the short chain fatty acids that they produce, and we or our gut, you know, pays them back with these services. That that's probably started from the beginning when in in evolution, the first microbes, by pretty by coincidence, decided to settle in the in in the in the gut of the most primitive um, you know marine animals. So there's definitely there's this concept of an of, of an economy is. Is is right on, you know, to the way you could see this. It's it's really presented like that, but I, I think that's a, it's a very good way of saying it. And then in in food, I've only seen one study about this, but I don't really know if it's conclusive. What happens to the DNA and RNA inside the food we eat? Do you think that we make use of it somehow, or is it all just burned up in the stomach? So that's a good question. I mean, there is a phenomenon called lateral gene transfer. You know that. For example, microbes can transfer or have transferred in evolution some of their own uh, DNA onto human cells in the in the gut. That's probably how our neurotransmitters in the enteric nervous system and ultimately in our brain came about from the molecules that the microbes had developed. From the food itself, I don't think that there's any transfer of that of that genetic information. Because I mean, it would be an extremely dangerous uh, design principle if 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 that could happen. There are organisms like viruses and like microbes that can do this in principle, that transfer you know genetic information. But um, there's no way that that food could do this because you know the, all the different kinds of foods that we eat with different genetic material, it wouldn't make any sense uh, anyway. If that happened. If that exchange happened between or happens between, you know, dietary components or plant components or animal components and microorganisms, that's another story. I mean, there's definitely a, a communication and exchange of design principles because some of the plants have similar molecules, like sim- similar hormones 
um, estrogen-like compounds that we find also in the you know in the in the microbes, but also in our human system. So there's clearly that link between plants and food and microorganisms, but not directly to us humans. I don't know. I mean, if what happens if I eat fermented foods and it has bacteria all over it and it survives the stomach acid and those end up populating my gut? Or if I take a probiotic that's designed to survive the stomach acid? I mean, that's not natural, let's say, but I mean, wholesale bacteria and probably associated phages get into our guts. I mean, they end up in our body. I wonder if uh, some of them stay in residence so they can, you know, maybe the um, the RNA and DNA and the foods we eat aren't actively changing us, but maybe our bacteria can, you know, maybe some are left by the time they get to our colon bacteria and the bacteria can either incorporate um, elements of it they find or not. Maybe they use them to to alter their, <laughs> you know, their interaction with us. I don't know. Yeah, so this, you know, what I said just a minute ago, this principle of lateral gene transfer is definitely something that has been, that is known, that can happen between cells, certainly between microbes. So microbes in evolution probably have done this on a regular basis to transfer genes from one type of microbe to another. And also, as I said, I think that gene transfer probably almost certainly happened between certain microbes and and human cells, but particularly, the, you know, in, in, in terms of transferring synthetic pathways or transferring neuro, neurotransmitters, that, that's almost certainly the case. Also, you know, we know our mitochondria are actually, you know, originated as bacteria that have been incorporated as, as, as an intact, you know, microbial organism into our mammalian cells. So, the transfer, not only in terms of genetic material, but in terms of the entire microbe. So there's, there's clearly this flexibility. But your, your question, if DNA uh, from the plants can go directly to uh, to our human cells and being absorbed and influence us. You know, this is probably gross, but, you know, if I think about the colon, it's it's in different states all the time. It's empty. It's then filling up and stool is forming, and then there may be quite a bit, and the person goes to the bathroom, and now it's empty again. So its environment would change, I would think, very dramatically in the cyclical way. What do you think that tells us? Does that reveal any any mechanisms about what's going on? Has anyone kind of looked and sampled, you know, someone's stool, let's say, on a on a longitudinal basis and seen how it interacts with, you know, what it tells them about what the composition of the, of the bacteria is in the colon? You know, over time? Yeah, so first of all, this gut microbial system is not static. You know, it, it changes not only with the diurnal rhythm, so it's different when we, you know, when we when we sleep and when we don't eat for eight hours. They're definitely different, the, the microbial interactions with, with our gut cells, our immune cells. Also, after a bowel movement where we get rid of a very large number. I forgot what the percentage is. I mean, like, um, could even be 90% of the bacteria transiently, you know, leave the colon. The thing is, there's, there's a, there's a blueprint that exists in our gut that even if, you know, there's a marked decrease in the, in the abundance, it, it, it will come back exactly with the same composition and the same players. It's so fluctuations in, total amount or you know density does not does um does not influence the the stability of, of the, the the basic blueprint of your gut microbial ecosystem it's so there have been studies you know during what happens after after fasting most of these studies have been done in in mouse models and they have generated a lot of interest in terms of generated a lot of interest in terms of this intermittent fasting where you can manipulate the, the the population and the interactions of the, the microbes with our gut and so I, mean, I forgot so you you your main question was how much do we know about this or well that particular environment like the sigmoid colon you know the end of the line again if i was a cell living there i would my environment would change a lot like again it would be empty at one point after a person goes to the bathroom then it starts filling up and stool starts forming in there and it gets to be pretty large the whole area is filled up. Now I'm in a totally different environment. You know, the stool is full of bacteria and there's materials in there that are used or not used. 
now the person empties their colon again. Now I'm back in this old environment. And so it's like a, it's like a very, I don't know, it feels like a very dynamic environment to, to be there. So has anyone studied the dynamics of the, the lower colon, the sigmoid colon? Because again, I think you'd see a, a huge changeover of, you know, materials and chemicals present, bacteria present, et cetera. Yeah, that's, you know, it's, it's a little bit more difficult to study this in humans. Because if you want to look at the stool and regional changes of the microbial, uh, the, the microbial ecosystem, which means in different parts of the intestine, that's quite difficult to do in, 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 in humans. Also, typically people have a bowel movement once a day at a particular time. So you can't really say, I'm going to compare this to what it was like right after the meal or right after bowel movement. So this is not easy to study. There's, um, it's definitely something that will move the field will move from looking at stool samples that are taken they're not even always taking at the same time you know when 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 we do studies we don't tell the the study subject i need a stool sample exactly from six o'clock in the morning when you wake up and i need another one after you've eaten it it's in humans it's just not you just can't do that you know and so we rely on 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 mouse models and as I said, I mean, mouse models have been studied with... You know, it would be a good model for this is rabbits. My daughter's had rabbits and those things eat and poop constantly all day long. They would be probably really easy to get that done because they're just yeah. constantly doing it. Yeah, no, that's... But but then it would be hard to compare this to the human GI tract, you know, which functions quite differently. That's always a dilemma to um, extrapolate findings that you have in in animal models who have different patterns of um, digestion and defecation, um, and then, uh, you know, make a conclusion what happens in humans, you know, because in humans, it's affected by, by your emotion, how well you slept, what you ate the night before. So yeah, some of the questions, I mean, this, this is, a, is an excellent question. I would say, what we can say, there's, there's a lot of fluctuations, tremendous fluctuations throughout the day, also throughout the night. So for example, when you're fasting, you know, your whole contractile pattern in the, in the GI tract changes to one that's a rhythmic pattern. So every, every 90 minutes, you have a big contractile wave starting in the esophagus, going down all the way into the colon and moving everything with it through this wave. So, you know, the microbial environment changes dramatically every 90 minutes during when, uh, when you fast, or, which, which happens in most people only during, during sleep. So that's another variation that comes in, you know, that, um, but overall the, um, it's, it's clearly a design of a system that can deal with tremendous variations, but remain stable. You know, you don't change your, your average, uh, diversity or your average richness or abundance, relative abundances of the individual players, which, which is remarkable. You know, it goes through dramatic changes throughout day and night. But the system stays the same. And that's kind of a, when I said earlier, you know, that the expression, the brain gut microbiome system is the best expression because systems are designed in engineering to uh, have both flexibility and, and uh, stability, tremendous stability, resilience, uh, resistance to change. So I would say this, uh, the best answer to your question is, this, what, what, what you're asking is exactly what the brain gut microbiome system does all the time, maintaining stability in the face of tremendous variations. When people talk about diversity, you know, they harp on about diversity, what do they mean? Do they mean strain diversity, metagenomics diversity? What kind of diversity means something when you talk about the gut? Yeah, certainly strain diversity is an important one. So, you know, many uh, take the, the earlier techniques like the 16S RNA, uh, ribosomal RNA techniques of measuring relative abundances uh, didn't really get down to the to the strain level. Stated, that, you know, at best at the species level, most typically even at a higher category of, of, of classification. And but you really what's really most interesting is the diversity at the at the at the strain level, at the finest granularity. And um, so diversity just means, you know, how many, 
how many different, I mean, how many different strains are there? So you could say you have a diverse ecosystem, but your different strains are represented by a very small number. Uh, extrapolating this to to a city where, where, where you say it's it's a highly diverse city, this could mean you know you have you have one African American family, you have one Native American family, you have one Korean family, and you have you know many families that are Caucasian. So that would be a diverse population. What's important, but that wouldn't really be a good ecosystem with resilience and and, and resistance. What you would need is um, richness of these individual players. So the combination of richness and diversity is really what determines the stability of an ecosystem, if that makes sense to you. So we... Okay. I, I, I guess I figured it as like a job center. You know, there's multiple different bacteria can do the same job. And, you know, in our guts, there's there's certain, you know, there's calls for certain things to be made and certain things to be produced. And depending on what you are, you know, you either can work in the job center or not. But again, you're not the only one that can work there. Yeah, that's that that's true. But so you could say, you know, you, you could have a diversity based on, on white collar and blue collar workers. That wouldn't tell you too much about the 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 actual property of that of that ecosystem. If you break these white collar and blue collar workers down into the subcategories with the greatest granularity. In a society like the, the U.S., you would have a tremendous, you know, variety and diversity of of those of the type of people that do specific things and are very specialized. On, uh, I mean, just look at medicine. You know, uh, um, in earlier ages, you would have internists and surgeons. Now you go into internists and you break it down into not only into cardiologists and pulmonologists and gastroenterologists, but each one of those subspecialties has, again, several subspecialties. So the more diverse that system gets, uh, the more connections are between these individual players. You know, the the expert who does the endoscopies on your gut needs to communicate with the the expert that does um, with a pathologist and with a, with a nutritionist and so you had you, it forms a a network i mean the, the the key here is the diversity creates networks of players and the networks are between what we call in network science the edges between um hubs and and and, and between nodes it's it's the number of edges that that connect for example one uh, node that makes for example one node a a, a hub or having much more influence and it's it's very similar, and, and we do apply the same kind of network uh, mathematics to the microbiome system. And I would say, you know, to, to answer your question, the diversity is is one criteria that gets you to a very complex network, and it's the network stability that we're interested in. Okay. If I shrunk you, you know, into a tiny size and put you in my large intestine, what would you observe? Would you see spider webs of of biofilms kind of overlapping each other and interacting with each other or what do you think it looks like it's not just individual bacteria just you know floating around in there like a soup i would think it's structured somehow right yeah you would actually see and experience a lot so first of all uh, you know you would need an oxygen tank because it's an oxygen free environment um it's you would need lights because it's completely dark so you know you need the oxygen you need the lights uh, then what you would see is a very com- complex, structured geographical system. It's not just everything floating around there. You know, it's um, we know this, for example, from the, the the microbiome in your in your oral cavity in your mouth, where spatial structures have been identified. So, so the network is not something that is flexible and floats around. It's really structures between individual microbes that are create an architecture of this. So you would see that you would see, you know, a, a big um, mucus layer that uh, is an like a big fence that separates you that are swimming in the middle of this uh, from actually getting close to the wall of the gut with the immune cell sensors. And you would also see that, um, you know, there's Different communities. So the the way if, if if you slowly could go down from your small intestine to the colon, 
you would encounter totally different communities with different players, different uh, environmental conditions like uh, the pH, the acidity. So it it would be a, a fascinating journey through your gut, you know, not just seeing the big things, but also this whole microbial world, not just going like with a submarine through it, but it would be with a microscope that allows you to see all these individual details of, of, of the system. It would be fascinating, right. you know, uh, to see that. Yeah, it's like that movie from, I think, the 60s or 70s, like The Incredible Journey, where they shrunk down these people and injected them into this guy and inside this tiny little submarine. I don't know if, exactly. you, if you ever saw it. Yeah. yeah, but in the 60s, you know, a lot of things we know now that are going on in the gut, they didn't even know, you know, so... That journey, if you made this movie today, it would look very different. You know, it would. It I would wish they a, would. That'd be super cool if they made a movie like that today. Yeah, no, I think it'd be great, great educational tool. Yeah, well, very good. Well, Emron, let's restate where people can get your book. I guess it's on Amazon and Kindle and everywhere. Is it? Uh, is it published yet, or what's the date? Uh, it's coming out in in four weeks. Okay. Yeah, you can go to Amazon or. Um, if you go to my website, um, you know, it, it, it lists all the booksellers. So we, I mean, I encourage and the publisher encourages people to go to a diverse group of booksellers, you know, not exclusively to Amazon. You can pre-order it now. And there's certain, if you look at my newsletter, there's certain prizes that we give for people that do that. So from free copies of my first book, signed copies to access to a one-to-one -one or five-to-one conversation with me answering questions. So I, I would like to encourage people to, you know, to order this book now. And um, yeah, the book is called The Gut Immune Connection, Understanding Why We're Sick Can Help Us Regain Our Health. And I'm speaking to Dr. Emran Mayer. His name is spelled E-M-E-R-A-N. Last name is M-A-Y-E-R. So Emran, thank you very much for coming. Thanks for giving me this opportunity to, to talk to you. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.